panelists say I'd like to welcome our panelists to say a word in the, by word of hello, hi, and then we go into the session. We'll start with Tambra. Thank you so much, Lucy, um, and thank you all for attending today's important conversation. Um, I'm currently based in Washington, D.C., um, founder and CEO of WANDA, and also a doctoral student in American University School of Communication. And though I have a degree in nutrition and public health, one may wonder why not pursue a PhD in nutrition? Well, to uh, the spirit of this conversation, I began to realize the importance of media and how it shapes the way we think about food and think about health and think about culture, and especially when we think about our African culture. Um, and so my, though I was born in Oklahoma, uh, which is middle of America, my heritage goes to the Fulanis in Northern Nigeria, what would be uh, formerly known as Hausaland. And so when you think about dishes like Kuka and Tuo or uh, millet or fonio or zobo, um, many of these dishes one may never know um, unless you're part of the culture. And so in order to change the narrative, we've seen the benefit of social media, though it has had a number of issues around disinformation and misinformation, we have an opportunity to take this form of technology to help uh, change the narrative um, as we think about African culture. Uh, the legacy media, when we think about a Washington Post or we think about BBC, how and which has African food and our culture been framed and how does it shape the way we think about ourselves? Because ultimately food is identity, food is culture, food is medicine, and ultimately food is power. And we are ultimately here to have a conversation of how do we shift the power in the hands of the people through the power of recipes, through the power of cookbooks, and through the power of simply your visual presence when we look at the issues of either misrepresentation or extraction or exploitation or um, erasure when it comes to even linking up, giving credence and um, credibility um, and really credit to those who've been pioneering in food, whether it's in the American South and shaping recipes that stem back to the original soul food in, in West Africa um, or to present day modern techniques of African foods being made today with fusion dishes that we see. But I look forward to the conversation with my fellow panelists and let's dig in. Thank you, Tamber. Uh, well, we'll turn to Oni who is working um, at the point where I'm most interested in or in the grass food, grassroots of Nigeria, because that's where I'm originally from. So let's hear um, Oni. Yeah, hi everybody, good morning. Um, I am based in Minneapolis, uh, Minnesota. Um, and as Lucy mentioned, uh, I was born and raised in Nigeria. And it is a big, big uh, heritage of mine. And, um, and I think that also led me to found a good soul company um, where I focus on um, packaging pickle nuts uh, that are grown in Nigeria um, and has then um, packaged and exported um, into the US um, and it's made available um, on Walmart online. And I think this is um, a big part of the conversation that we're having today, right? Is like, how do we um, as African entrepreneurs, uh, both home and abroad, um, contribute uh, to the growth um, of the African uh, food ecosystem? And, you know, how do we continue to showcase all the great work that are being done by African entrepreneurs um, and also just increase uh, the access that African entrepreneurs have uh, globally? Um, so in that way that um, consumers around the world can be able to enjoy um, all the amazing food um, and beverages uh, that are coming out of Africa. Um, so really excited to jump into this conversation um, and looking forward to you know, discussing more with the panelists. Thank you, Oni. Um, would like to welcome Dolakmo, who is also um, working in the food space as a recipe creator. 
She's done, I'm mean, an avid follower of her pages on social media and um, would like to get a take, her own take from this in this conversation. Hello everyone, my name is Dola Bogre and I'm a food content creator. I share recipes that are easy to follow. I show people how to use our local ingredients to create and make food that's delicious. You know, and I'm excited to join this conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Dolako. We have one more panelist. I think she's experiencing some technical difficulties, Mosun um, Umuru. We're hoping that at some point she'll join us in this conversation, but we'll just go straight in and ask, um, our opening questions. What role does Africa currently play in the global food ecosystem? And I'd like um, Tambra to touch on this. Tambra. Thank you, Lucy, for that question. Um, we know in the rhetoric around feeding um, a billion plus people um, in the world that we need Africa um, due to the arable land um, that is really um, the gold of the world as more urban development is happening in the West from Europe to, to the US. And we recognize that Africa is not only a critical part when it comes to agriculture, but also in shaping culture. Um, because we've seen as development in India and Asia has continued that we are looking for new tastes um, for our palates and African cuisine is the new frontier. And this is why this conversation is so important and the innovation and creativity in the kitchen that chefs are doing um, are important as much as elevating the nutritional benefits of our African heritage foods too, which um, has been highlighted in much research and we continue to be pushing the agenda on more research on African cuisines and their nutritional benefits as well. Can you cite some innovations that excite you about the, um, the future of food? One moment. Well, um, while Tambra starts um, her glitch, uh, we'll move on to Oni to discuss what do African entrepreneurs, how do they play? What do we do in defining the future of food? Tambra, we'll come back to you. We just, uh, just moved on to Oni now to talk about the role that African entrepreneurs play in defining the future of food. Yeah, thank you for the question. I think like there, there's, um very pivotal role uh, that African entrepreneurs play. And I think um, when you look at just the total, uh, you know, value chain of the um, African food um, ecosystem, um, everyone from you know, the farmers who, um, you know, grow the crops uh, to the logistics players, right, that transport, um, you know, all the way to those that, uh, that process and package um, and ultimately the selling and distribution you know, these are all the aspects that are um, involved in bringing um, food to table, right? And all the entrepreneurs that, that play, you know, within each of these, uh, you know, value chain are very important. And we're actually seeing um, an uprise of, of agri-tech um, in, in Africa as well, where we're seeing um, entrepreneurs that are either launching, um, you know, digitized farming or, or launching, um, you know, various ways to, um, improve efficiency within the supply chain. Um, so at the end of the day, like having these African entrepreneurs being empowered and being funded, um, you know, would truly secure feeding Africa's youth uh, population. Um, you know, so these are some of the aspects that I think that as the future of food continues to evolve um, and more demand continues to, uh, you know, to show that African entrepreneurs um, represented also by this panel, um, it's really doing a wonderful job in plugging some of those gaps. Thank you, Oni. Um, Dolako, this is your, your own angle now. What do you think chefs and cooks and recipe enthusiasts and fusion uh, champions, what part do you think they have to play in the future of food in Africa? I feel chefs and cooks bring to the table their passion for cooking by building a food system that fits people. We eat to survive because food is an important part of our lives, but we need to eat well. 
you know, we come up with creative and innovative ways to cook our food, you know, show how to care and improve on our cooking by using quality and inexpensive ingredients to cook nutritious meals. Uh, you know, because uh, food defines habits and we are shaping the cooking culture of the future. Thank you, Dolakpo. Um, we're going to circle back to Tambra. Um, I hope uh, you're still on the question of the exciting, some innovations that excite you about the future of food in Africa. Yeah, I would say Chef Pierre Tom is from Senegal is one that comes to mind with um, his restaurant, not only in New York that um, he once had, but also in Nigeria and now helping to elevate Fonio and all the many different creative ways in which you can prepare that dish, um, whether it's from a side dish to a main dish. Um, from grain bowls to smoothies um, to desserts. Um, it's been amazing to see how you can take, you know, one, a product that is gluten-free, that is climate smart, uh, that is of African descent and elevate it to make it accessible, not only to uh, Africa, but really to the world. Um, and to me, that is a model that can be replicated in thinking of, how to elevate other indigenous grains that we know in the conversation of climate change is critical um, in order to both feed the people, but also help save the planet. Because ultimately, if food is not doing both of that, um, it is not sustainable and it's not um, ideal for humanity. And Africa truly is that source of those indigenous crops, um, what we call heritage crops that we have been working through my role as a USDA advisory board member uh, to talk about how does the West play a critical role in helping expand access to market opportunities um, by investing in a research agenda that helps to send to Africa on our plates. Um, that is something that I've championed for more than a decade and will continue to beat that drum as the conversation of food as medicine is elevated that whose food is medicine? Is it just Mediterranean diet or is it the investment of also African or our medicine as well? Thank you. Um, I'll just speak a little bit about changing narratives Africa because this is where we, this is where we play. Um, we are players in this field, the food space. We're using food as a bridge to a larger and wider conversation around Africa's contributions to global food e ecosystem. We want to increase local sourcing from Africa. And when you source from Africa, you create um, jobs, you improve livelihoods of both farmers, families, women in particular, and young people, get young people engaged. We also promote gender equity because We've worked, most of our work, we find that women are a major stakeholder amongst the farmers, amongst the founders and the leaders of the organizations that we are working and collaborating with. We, we actively do track gender engagement through um, the, looking at the supply and distribution um, channels. And then ultimately we want to build positive messages and experiences associated with Africa. Um, from that angle, I'd like to invite Oni to please tell us how is, how, what are some of the ways to showcase Africa's dynamics, Oni? All right, yeah. So that's a very good question. And I'm glad that you, uh, you know, prefaced uh, changing narratives Africa and as that was also another point that I was, you know, going to make is, um, you know, for us to really, you know, showcase Africa's um, dynamic and innovative um, entrepreneurs, like, first of all, it, it really starts from um, facilitating the trade, right, of, of our African grown products and packaged products um, into consumers' hands around the world, right? And I think there are many um, organizations um, that are all geared towards this mission, right? Because if we, um, you know, think back to the uh, to the value chain um, and think about the farmers and everyone that plays a role um, into the food, uh, you know, value chain, um, if at the end of the day, consumers are not buying the product or not consuming, the, you know, consuming um, the food, 
then that cycle um, and that reinvestment um, that we need, um, you know, may not be happening. And I think this is something that, you know, Changing Narratives Africa is doing a wonderful job in, is first of all, identifying um, all the um, activities uh, that needs to get done, especially when you think about um, you know, cross-border, right? Like if you're moving a product um, from Ghana um, into a U.S. retail market, um, you know, there are so many challenges and so many, um, you know, processes involved in, in, in bringing that to life. And once we can solve those challenges and problems and get to a place where, um, you know, any a coconut company that started, um, you know, in Kenya can have the ambition, you know, to be, uh, at Walmart or Target, uh, you know, here in the U.S., it really, you know, really starts to showcase, uh, you know, those potentials. I think we also need the opportunity for, you know, for platforms that can elevate and amplify um, the African entrepreneur voices. Um, you know, this could be whether it's, you know, through podcasts or conferences or three shows, but we need, um, you know, an opportunity that can continue to show um, what is coming out of Africa? Um, I think this conversation that we're having here um, at Catalyst 2030, it's a big part of that as well. Um, and it continues to expose all the great work that are happening. Um, but more of that needs to happen, right? Like we, we, you know, we just need to continue um, to expand that, you know, market access. And I think when we do that, then the world and, and global consumers can truly see, um, you know, what is happening in Africa um, and how you know, some of the ingredients and food that we even uh, consume here in the U.S. Um, are all in one way or the other, you know, coming out of Africa. Thank you, Oni. Um, I have a question now for, uh, I think Musun is online now. I'm not, if you'd let us know if your technical difficulties with Saudi out, would be happy to welcome you into the conversation. Meanwhile, I wanted to just touch base with what some of the things that are being done um, in the space of moving goods from Africa to the US. We have eight fellows this year. And part of the things that we're trying to do is to say, try an African meal, the, um, the ingredients are available. But the reality is that we have to open a trade way, some connection to make sure those ingredients are actually on the shelves in the stores that we generally go to, that we don't have to uh, travel miles and miles to go find where the ingredients are. So the fellows in our program this year, we have people working in spices, um, in superfoods like moringa, teas. Uh, we have the nuts, those are working in nuts, plantains and peppers. And the idea is get these items on the global mainstream retail stores so that I go to, for example, a Walmart and I find what I, I need to make okra soup, everything that I need to make my okra soup, not just the okra, the okra is already there, but I need to be able to get the spices that go along with that to bring that food full circle. And uh, it might seem myopic when you look at it from that angle, but there's a larger conversation around it. Being able to have a one-stop solution that you have for, for example, you want to make a Mexican meal is a one-stop solution. You walk into Walmart, you get everything you need, and that food is on its way to, to getting cooked. We want to be able to have those solutions for African countries. Another conversation that we're trying to put across is Africa is a continent. If you have traveled into Africa, can you say where you went? Say you went to Senegal, say you went to Gambia and say something intelligent about Gambia that you found out as opposed to saying when I was in Africa. Um, so we, we are trying to distill the conversation down to Africa being identified as a 54 countries as opposed to being just one country. So it's a very big job that we've taken on as Changing Narratives Africa. We're excited about the opportunity to showcase Africa. We do appreciate the work that is going to go into making that a reality. Um, and I think the strongest thing we're doing right now is collaborating with people that are doing great work, recognizing things that have been done in the past and the potential for the future, encouraging young people to innovate by giving them a platform to showcase what they've done. I think um, ultimately changing mindsets about Africa, telling positive stories about our food, our culture, where we come from, why we do what we do, why our food tastes the way it tastes, and um, giving our food, elevating our food to the status of 
the renowned pizza. I mean, like you're going for, everybody wants to have a pizza. Okay, I want to have puff puff. It shouldn't be a big deal. Um, we have to be able to have those conversations and elevate our different uh, delicacies to the forefront, just like every other group, every other country and every other culture that is pushing their sushis, pushing their Chinese food. Um, I will go back to, I'll go back to Tambra because Tambra has been very, very, very active in social media in the past week. I've been following all the things you're doing. You've spoken in several, um, many fora. And I want to see what role do you think that social influencers can bring to bear in this conversation? Besides the cooks, the chefs, the, the academics, what do social influencers have that they can help in pushing the conversation to the next level? Yeah, that's a great question um, because one, we know that when we have platforms like this to create public discourse, that public discourse gives way to shaping public policy and ultimately impacts the outcomes of our communities. And so we need to elevate more conversations when we think about IG Live, Facebook Live, Zooms, how do we continue to beat the drum and create that traction and make this conversation go viral of this idea of like, wow, there is market opportunity here. And in the name of capitalism, we know wherever the market is, more product, more program, more innovation will happen in order to fuel and feed that market. And so if nothing else, a takeaway is to understand that we have the power. We can leverage these platforms to exhibit our power through the kind of conversations we choose to engage in. And we have to know the colonial taxes that will divide and conquer conversations. And what I mean by that is keep the message focused. If we know that we need to change the narrative on Africa, don't feed into negativity keep it positive, keep it empowering, understand that we can either have media tools to be weaponized or to be liberated and to understand your history, our history, and to know how to move the conversation forward that ultimately will give way to the public policy changes that we need to see. We know that the African Union has said, this is the year of food and nutrition security. We know that is the situation here in the US as well. We know that during the time of the pandemic, it has highlighted the importance that when, you, when, a, when a man is hungry, he will go to war. And so yeah. we need to understand that we must feed the people. But the question is, what are we choosing to feed them? And we say not only feed them African foods, but make sure that the person who is procuring, growing and serving the food is compensated well, that is able to protect their own livelihoods and families and is able to do so in a manner which which is uplifting and empowering and having dignity, not only in the food, but in the conversation and the people who are part of the process is so critical. Thank you so much. Um, Oni, I'm, I'm gonna ask you this because I think you're gonna give um, an answer that I haven't thought of before. Um, fingers crossed. Um, we are talking about changing the conversation, uh, the narrative, steering the conversation to positive areas, empowering entrepreneurs to innovate and push their ideas forward. Um, the truth of the matter is scale. There are so many small and medium scale enterprises in Africa working to make all these changes happen, but if they do not have the funding um, and the capacity to meet the demand for, the potential demand for the African products that they are making, um, it's almost like a pipe dream. What do you think, um, how do you think we can revamp the funding streams, looking at how does Africa scale this? Why, how do we get to a critical mass where um, the products flood the market, literally, as opposed to being a handful of things in Walmart, two tins of uh, something in somewhere else? How do we make this um, a doable quest for the small and medium enterprises um, taking this challenge on? Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, I think there's really, uh, when, it, you know, when it comes to investment in Africa and, and the kind of funds that are flowing in, um, it almost seems like, um, you know, investment is going into every sector except agriculture and except uh, food production. Um, you know, perhaps some of that is just the rise of um, technology or like fintech, especially across Africa, where like mobile payments have become more popular, 
Um, so you're seeing, um, you know, the fintech sector getting a lot more funding. Um, you know, so I think most of us have, uh, you know, probably heard of Andela, you know, coming out of um, coming out of Nigeria, um, you know, and, and other, you know, fintech platforms. So for us to really change the narrative about that is like, how do we get investors to care about agriculture, to care about food production? Um, and I think where the appetite really is, is how does technology play a role, right? Like, how do we continue, um, you know, to elevate uh, just the agriculture and food um, ecosystem away from the manual, you know, mundane, um, you know, process to infusing technology, to infusing, um, you know, science, um, and also getting the younger population um, to be interested, right? So, like, now we're seeing a lot of them, you know, younger uh, graduates coming out of Africa really, um, you know, like the fintech job is more of the of the um, attractive, sexy job that um, that they want to do. But how do we, um, you know, invest more into agri tech, right? Um, in a way that um, you know will will engage the uh, uh, the youth into the um, you know into the sector, and which will also by increasing that participation rate uh, from the youth, then I think that also leads to um, you know, some of the funding that we need. Without funding, you really can't fuel innovation. I mean, and that's, and that applies to whatever sector you, you know, you're in, you know, you need funding to do research, to do the development, to do the, um, the commercialization. Um, you need funding to increase the quality um, of the packaged foods that we're getting. Um, you need funding for the distribution and selling. Um, so I think the, the conversation is, is increasing participation um, from the youth um, you know, increasing the attractiveness um, of the sector um, and balancing the manual um, aspect of agriculture and food production with, you know, cutting edge technology um, and modern, you know, manufacturing and packaging um, in a way that honestly elevates the total experience, um, you know, for everyone. So I think that's what the investors are looking at, right? They're, you know, they're really looking at what is the talent that's available and with the money that I'm investing in this company, the leadership, the skills, all the, you know, all of those things that investors look at when making an investment into a company, um, are those available in Africa? Um, I think they are, um, but we just need to do a better job of um, of engaging everyone, um, you know, within that value chain. So hopefully you. That, that answers your question. <laughs> well, yes, I'm happy that you 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 touched on the things that I was hoping that you would touch on. And I think it's a bigger conversation beyond this panel, uh, especially as it relates to sustainable development goals. The, we talking about food systems policy for Africa. We need to make sure that it's aligned to the achievement of the SDGs at all levels, from the international to the grassroots and community level. Um, I hope that from this, our conversation and all the hundreds of conversations that are happening throughout this um, uh, SDG summit, that will be able to pos position and link the revival of African food systems to improve health and nutrition out outcomes. Because the SDGs are all linked in one world. It's almost like a, a, a flow chart. You, you solve one and it begins to solve the second one and begins to solve the next one. So we're hoping that we can position the, and link the revival of African food systems to improved health and nutrition outcomes, and which will both address under nutrition and overnutrition and find evidence-based common ground between science and indigenous knowledge. Um, I'm hoping that uh, we can have uh, Mosun speak to the sustainable development goals and Africa's contribution. Um, Mosun. Hi everyone, sorry. Um, thank you for having me on the, on the conversation, join the conversation, Lucy. It's, um, it's very interesting times, especially as we've just come out of COVID, you know, everyone is thinking of ways to innovate, contribute to the food systems across Africa. And what I have seen and what I have constantly championed is the fact that nothing can be done in isolation. And it speaks to what Oni's concerns were around, why is the inflow of investment not channeled or funneled into the agricultural space? It's basically because over time we've all, it looks like we're all working, but we've been working in silos. There haven't been a lot of collaboration, 
we the end goal in mind being that we just want to put Africa, make Africa food sustainable and also put Africa on the food, global food map. Um, but where we are now, if you all recall during the pandemic, um, I mean, initial forecast was that people were going to die all over the streets on the continent, but the reverse was the case. And why? It means that there's something tied to our food system. There's something tied to our indigenous foods that still keeps us out of danger. And it's time for us to begin to look critically at scaling the production of those food items and ensuring that as we create jobs, as we alleviate poverty, as we improve food production and enhance productivity, we need to link everything all back to um, the real concern of keeping man alive. And that has been one of the work that some of us have focused, um, spent our time doing. And I know that coming together now as, and creating this new group and platform, I am excited about the fact that we can all bring our individual knowledge into this pool and into this basket to ensure that Africa, one, becomes food sustainable, two, we eradicate poverty, three, we're able to actually improve our health and also be a part of shaping um, nutrition globally because we do have indigenous foods on the continent. I mean, since, since the pandemic, I can tell you, for example, I have eating strictly organic food products to a very large extent. And even when I have 15, 16 people within my team and family falling down with COVID, at no point did I test positive. That is something to hold on to significantly as an African. And I, I would love to see a situation where we begin to sell our food items to the world and it's appreciated, just like you said, Lucy, the way we appreciate pizza, the way we appreciate sushi. How do we put away do the juice it, as a basic, um, a staple diet in the US where everyone knows that this is extremely nutritious, it provides vitamins and, and you know people can actually stay healthy from these food sources. Thank you, Mosun. Thank you. I'm glad we got to hear your voice um, in this conversation. And to just tell you what you just said, I've, I believe that we should prioritize the conservation of African indigenous genetic resources, such as seeds and livestock, including and ensuring that seed policies include and accommodate farmer-based uh, practices, things that we've done traditionally that have worked. Um, I'm not saying we should go back to the ancient ages, but there are some things that we did that worked and we should in, in, take that the good part of it and blow it up. Um, and of course, negative practices that have not worked shouldn't be carried along, you know, just because it's culturally something that has been done for a long time. Um, I would like to ask Oni about how do we revive African cultures and practices as a pathway to reviving African food systems and showcasing its relevance to the world. Tambra. Uh, do you want me to go or you want Tambra to go? <laughs> okay, I think only you should go in if you're ready. Um, Tambra will fight you for it um, after you're done, <laughs> maybe. Yeah, so the, so the question is, you know, how do we um, expose like African culture? Uh, can you, the, can... How do we revive African cultures and practices as a pathway to reviving food systems? Yeah, I think, you know, I think the way that actually our African culture is viewed globally um, needs a lot of narrative changing. Um, and I think that in a way also impacts how our food is viewed, right? And I think um, a bright spot that I that I would say that I'm I'm mostly uh, plugged in, um, so to say, is, is let's you know uh, use Afrobeats or our our music as an example, um, you know. So like I think the way that our our you know Afrobeats has evolved over the past decade, um, you know, to the point now that um, in Minneapolis, Minnesota, I hear I hear Bonner Boy and Wizkid and a lot of the um, artist songs on the local radio, like yeah. you know, 10 years ago, like you probably would not, um, you know, hear that. Um, and for that to happen in Minneapolis, um, if you're really familiar with, you know, the US landscape, you can say, okay, maybe I can hear that in a New York or Houston 
um, or Atlanta that has a larger population of Africans, um, you know, but to have that, you know, we do have a large population of Africans here, but of course, like to have that, um, the music being played regularly, um, to me was a huge surprise. Um, and I think that, you know, um, all the investments and the excitement and the storytelling um, and just the growth that has happened with Afrobeats can apply to, um, you know, the food sector as well. And I actually think that, you know, as we're having this conversation, I think, um, you know, restaurant managers and chef have a huge role um, to play here as well. Um, just because the way that our food is presented, um, a lot of times, um, it's, it, you know, we're not fully telling um, the story behind our food and, um, and in a way that is appealing, in a way that is appetizing. So I really love the idea of like, you know, the recipe bank and how do you make, um, you know, some of these foods more accessible. Um, so we need a lot more marketing, um, you know, just to be able to expose um, our food. Um, and I think through that, then um, it also exposes our culture, right? Because I think like, um, you know, those that eat sushi, you probably know where sushi is from. You probably know what ingredients it is, you know, what culture is representing, right? And all of these things are all interconnected um, in one way. So looking at how Afrobeats has um, finally, you know, become mainstream, I think uh, that blueprint, we can, we can, you know, we don't have to reinvent the wheel. Um, yeah. You know, we can copy um, and, and in a way innovate and, and, and share like, you know, our food, um, you know, uh, more globally um, to the way that is more appealing. So Tambra, I don't know what you, you know, what you think about that. <laughs> Uh, first, I would like to say I'm a lover, not a fighter. Um, <laughs> and, and so with that, I, I concur with my Buddha. When we talk about the importance of leveraging, one, the culture and how music is like a pipe piper leading the people right to the food, right? So if you're going to have the food, definitely have the music to bring the people. And then you have to have the fashion. So like I'm wearing my good friend Kabonin. She's a Cameroonian designer. And so when I'm promoting food for the culture, I'm making sure that I'm doing it from head to toe, from my accessories to my wear, um, to even the actual uh, dishes and the bowls like made from sweet grass when you think about the beautiful bowls from Rwanda and Uganda. So there's so many ways in which that when we help to shape the narrative that we should do it fully because ultimately it changes the game, not only in the food industry, but all the other adjacent industries that feed into that supply chain from the cookware to the entertainment and music and, and fashion culture. And so one of the ways in which we've done it through is the power of education that we literally lack there's a vacuum of being able to educate people on African foods whether it's from preschool to college in the nutrition programs in the culinary programs there has been just a void and so being able to ensure that the next generation of not only chefs but doctors how are they being educated what are the textbooks being used I remember going to do a lecture in Kano uh, Medical School, as well as in Cape Coast and Hawassi University between Ghana, Nigeria, and Ethiopia, and recognizing how there is a, um, a, a lack of, of books um, sharing uh, these uh, this information. Um, and so I realized we have to play a critical role in making sure that information is present um, and, and why we've created our Wanda Academy uh, to educate women around the cultural value of their nutritional foods during the midst of the pandemic. Um, we and, and Wanda realize that we're not just consumers, but we're producers. So how do we link women up to women-owned farms, to women-owned food retailers? And also when it comes to the books, like why we've created the Wanda book series of being able to educate our girls um, and our boys of, of the power of our African food can be our medicine. And so we make that available in English and in Hausa, and we have them available um, of Little Wanda traveling to other countries like Ethiopia and Kenya and sharing their local foods um, along with highlighting the women and girls in the community. Um, and so we've also created um, the Wanda doll that we got a, secured a, a, a design patent on through USPTO 
about the importance of the intellectual property in our food. And so we saw the battle around injera um, when it was trying to be hijacked by European and then Europe, uh, Ethiopia had to get involved and fight for that. Um, we have to realize that there is uh, not only money to be made, but there is protection of the culture that has to be uh, understood through this process um, because cultural appropriation is real. People can say they've been inspired by an idea. Um, like the most recent situation, I think um, a year ago, there was a uh, an American woman who created a, a clean Asian restaurant and it in eight months closed because it went viral about what do you mean you're cleaning Asian food? <laughs> it's so tone deaf. And so we don't want to see when you elevate African food and everyone wants to play a game um, of how to make money off Africa and it's done in a way in which we see what's happening with jell-off, right? I don't know if anyone saw the images of I think British Airways was sell selling jell-off on the, on the flight or was it Delta to Ghana? But either way, now jell-off has gained popularity. You can thank Jamie Oliver, I guess, and the debacle of hashtag jell-off gate that created a whole conversation within the diaspora around like who makes better jell-off once it was colonized. Um, and it was understanding that we have the ability to have our foods go viral and it being monetized. But the question is, how do you protect the actual, uh, you know, in intent of the restaurant, uh, of the recipe in terms of flavor and culture uh, where it's not whitewashed? And that is going to be critical, the role that that, you know, women have played as cultural keepers um, of making sure that our foods are protected and they maintain their value um, is, is so important. And so, yes, calling people out, but also calling people in and setting policies and guidelines and building infrastructure, like is that's why there's gold mine opportunity um, if we see it as such and protect our foods as such. Wow, you've said so many things that I've only just thought of and really haven't said out loud. Um, well, let's go to Dolapo. Why? Because Dolapo has been putting out recipes online for years. I have been guilty of dubbing your recipes. You know, I want to make some I'm going to Dolapo great to get it. Um, how do you protect the ingredients that you put into your food? You know, just following from what, uh, what uh, Tambra has just said now, how do you how do you do you substitute ingredients? Do you Americanize the, we call it fusion. There's a beautiful way to put it. We call it fusion, but how do we um, secure the integrity of the recipe you're putting out and, and you're calling authentic Nigerian? Um, I've had a uh, conversation at a meeting sometime last week where the young woman went, you know what, I'm not going to be saying I'm authentic because I'm half this and half that. So everything I'm doing is fusion. I can't really say it's authentic African. So I just call it fusion, uh, fusion Africa. And I think when you put it like that, there's an authenticity, authenticity that goes with it because you've, you're point blank saying this is not the, the original recipe. I think... Um, the lockboard, uh, something happened to her connection. So anyway, but the point is, I do fusion too. I've had to cook foods for foreigners. Um, I've, had, I've been in a space where I can't use, uh, for example, crayfish in some of the th things that I cook because there's a con cultural sensitivity to the taste and the, um, the, the strength of the aroma of crayfish in a meal is not as appealing to other people as it is for me. So I don't know, Tambra, when you're saying we should know how we substitute, how, where do you sit on that? Um, we are not, we're not taking away from the culture. This is where we are telling them to come in. We're saying, okay, crayfish problem. Don't worry, I've got it sorted out. Present the food slightly differently, but doesn't take away from the significance of the meal um, to the African who is eating it. I'm coming back to you, Tambra. So it's, it's interesting you say that because I'm a lover of cookbooks and I've been collecting them for more than a decade now. And one is, I can't remember the exact title, but it was um, the, the essence of it was how to make African food in a Western kitchen. 
um, and making those substitutes. And I would say even in my own home growing up as a kid, you know, my stepfather was Ghanaian. And so we would make Ghanaian food, like goat soup. We can make it because we actually have goat farms in Oklahoma and but when it came to fufu like there's no cassava there was um biscuit so my mom got creative used biscuit in exchange of fufu and so it was one of those moments where like yeah if you don't have access to an African international market in your town because maybe the African community is too small or someone was just like no you should be a doctor an engineer a banker not you know open up a food store um this is where we realize like people are not able to help support and elevate the culture and so yes there have been these inventive ways in which people have been making um a way to get a taste of africa even by working with and substituting western ingredients i think the the intent um obviously it becomes comes off quite differently when you think about how Jamie uh, did his Ghanaian jollof recipe. Um, I don't think it was an intent um, to just simply substitute, but to uh, create a more civilized version, or at least that's what history uh, would tell us um, in how uh, African food historically has been seen and, and food from Global South period has been seen as the othering. Um, and so I think there's a there's one, yes, a way to substitute, but at the same time, the goal actually is to get access to the food itself. Um, because to our point earlier, it makes market opportunities from the continent. Um, yes, people are growing farmers in Texas, growing sorghum, but I think because of the lack of topsoil in this country, um, soil health is a critical part to this conversation because what makes African food strong is the strong roots coming and growing in the African uh, sun and soil. And the nutritional uh, viability and density is equally as important as just simply having access to that okra or to that millet, that the environmental conditions is what also shape, just like our people, like strong people, strong food. It's, it's the conditions of Africa that have made us strong, that has been baked in our memory cells that allow us to be resilient and resist and overcome and, and really champion through. And so our food should replicate that same dynamic when we think about the sun and the soil is as much as what we're consuming um, as the actual food and ingredients itself. So I always talk about is like the transfiguration of Jesus, you know, it's the process, the preparation and the product, it, all three, just like the Holy Trinity that we have to think of when we're thinking about what we're consuming and eating. Thank you so much, Tambura. I'd like, as we, we're going to round off the session, but I want Mosun to, uh, you know, say something um, to follow the line of questioning that you just answered and uh, perhaps put a spotlight on the sustainable development goals, how this session ties into that. Okay, thank you so much, Lucy. I mean, Tambura, very insightful thoughts you've shared out there. I mean, we're Africans and our food represents who we are, the essence of who we truly are. And taking out of it sometimes may just deplete the power that it really carries. Um, I recall that at some point I did have some health challenges and I had to do a tweak to my food. For example, I mean, Lucy would know, if you know the Edgusi, the melon that we actually put in one of the soups that is a main sta staple down here, I had to find an alternative that was a healthy substitute. And it would amaze you that for the last seven years, I've literally eaten almonds as a substitute for egusi. And, and I, it has also become a, it's, it's become a thing amongst my friends now to say, oh, they never even thought of that as a substitute, you know? But the, the, but the point for me is, how do we ensure that even if we create substitutes from the local traditional options where we do not find the traditional options, we ensure that we are still time back to, back to our roots, not losing the essence of who we are. I constantly like to say that every food type and every food source on the continent is 
a key to unlocking wellness and health for citizens. And so we can't throw them away. As mystical as our simple pepper soup is, it's a herbal therapy and cure for a lot of sicknesses from your basic cold, nausea, kata, you know, influenza. And if you think about how powerful that is as a local meal or local drink, um, you want to see how we then take that to become something that the whole world appreciates and embraces. And it, it, it's sad that we couldn't get um, our other lady to speak about her recipes, but I, I like to look at the SDGs. For every step we take around African food items, what we will see is a multiplier effect and impact on the continent whether it's by education, because you, we, we can't sell our food to the world without educating people about the nutritional benefit of the food we're bringing to them or presenting to them. And as that begins to happen, what we will begin to see is unlock new opportunities, new vistas of opportunities on the continent for income generation, for building wealth, for increasing employment, for, for actually directing, bringing um, not just financial resource, but also bringing improved technology. Because I want, I'm looking forward to a time where we can begin to take every food item, every spice, every condiment, and actually take them to scale. One, via production. Two, begin to look at export on a consistent basis. If you look at how Sorrel has taken um, as um, penetrated the Western market as a drink that is put on the table. And you look at the region where sorrel is grown in Nigeria today, I wanna see how that directly impacts on, economy, on the economics um, of that region. You know, how do we take them away from poverty um, elevate that, take out insecurity, and then begin to help the citizens themselves take ownership and leverage that singular commodity as a source of income and, and build wealth. And this wealth is not just for some individuals, it's transgenerational, because the moment people begin to appreciate the essence of something that is so traditional to them, that is so indigenous to them, and they see how much resource they can, they can actually drive and, 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 and add to the world through just one commodity. For me, that is the excitement I have about working on the African food system. Um, because what will eventually happen on the continent is if we take 1,000, 2,000 different food items that we currently own and sell that to the world, we're not going to be the dark continent. We're actually going to be the solutions providers to the world. And, and I think it's that light I want us to shed on our indigenous foods and actually take that to scale. Thank you, Motun, for that contribution. We are running out of time, but there's been so much chatter on the, on the, mess, the chat board. Um, people are putting out suggestions. We are going to um, share these links. Well, I'm saving the chat so that we can share this to all those that signed onto it. Um, well, fortunately, we won't be able to go through all of them one by one, but there's been some really good links and in com uh, contributions um, put on into the chats. I'm just looking at it, but we really can't go through all of them one by one. Um, people, people. Um, that have signed on will get an email and we'll share this. So we'll just go through every single person that is a speaker here would we'll have a one liner close out um, call to action. Um, we we'll start with Oni. Can we put out some calls to action? Yeah, I think my call to action would actually, <clears throat> you know, hinge on the, on the comment about the regional impact of the foods uh, that we're growing. Um, I think that as we are working towards 
um, advancing and, and expanding all That's of our foods, um, you know, globally, I think there's also an opportunity for us to educate uh, back home um, and educate, you know, our farmers and our growers and everyone of the impact um, that their crop, uh, you know, will make. Um, and every day, with you know, I worked on a project, um, you know, a couple years ago. Uh, this was on a cashew farming community um, in Nigeria, and I brought a bottle of um, of, uh, of cashew, so roasted cashew, you know, processed in a bottle, um, similar to what we get, you know, in Nigeria. And I asked the farmers where they thought this cashew bottle, you know, the cashews came from. Um, these are cashew farmers that have been farming cashew for years, but they kept on saying U.S., China, like mentioning everywhere else except, um, you know, uh, back home because they're not seeing the transition from the raw cashews that they grow to the processed packaged cashews. Like just that alone, um, you know, was just unfathomable for them. Um, and I think it really exposes the education gap um, that we need to have also, um, you know, at the grassroots. So I think my call to action is really that grassroots education um, and to continue to, you know, showcase, um, you know, the, the potential um, of, our, of our food. myself tambra what's your call to action well to oni's point of grassroots education that is what we do at wanda and we have an upcoming event the sisterhood supper uh juneteenth celebration june 18th um which is a saturday in washington dc um at the well um we will put that information on our website. So sign up at iamwanda.org to our newsletter. Um, and we will share on our social media this week. Um, so follow us at iamwanda.org on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and LinkedIn. Um, and so we need us to continue to build the momentum of one, acknowledging that every woman and girl can see themselves as a food hero, um, and that we have collectively power to educate and advocate and innovate the food system that we want to see. And so always remember that and to know that if you don't see the change that you want, then you must be the change that you want to see in the world. Thank you so much, um, Mosun. Call to action. Thank you, Lucy. Um, I, I just want, I'd like to say to everyone here, um, let's try and collaborate a bit more. Um, each one of us is doing something. Yes, we would be the change. We need to be the change we all desire to see. Um, but somewhere along the line, it's important that we share resources with one another to help each other's work grow. Um, I also work with women and young people here back home in Nigeria, and it will be great to leverage the resources and knowledge, support of people like Oni, Tambra, in scaling the work that we do, just like I'm doing with you, Lucy, and your team at Changing Narratives. Um, it's important that we keep the work going. Um, it would happen, but each one of us just needs to put the work together. Um, Thank you so much for putting this together, this session. So we meet new people, network, leverage each other's competencies and actually share knowledge. Thank you, thank you. Well, thank you all of you, um, including um, the LACPO. I think some technical difficulty um, interrupted her participation, but we're glad we got to hear her. Um, I'm grateful that you guys made time to join us in this session and to discuss this. Um, ultimately, collaboration is key. All of us, we have little pockets of knowledge and experience, and you you can only push as far as you can as one person. But when once you go in with a, like a crowd with energy all mobilized towards a, a common cause, guess what? We're bulldozing that thing down. So instead of trying to be all things to all men, let us do our bit empower the next person to join in and invite the next person to join in. I think the conversation can never be exhausted in a one hour um, session like this, but I'm glad that it's, it's we're lending our voice to what is going on in all the other sessions for this uh, change, uh, change Catal Catalyst 2030 um, conference. Thank you everyone for joining us. Um, it's been a pleasure. We will communicate with all those that um, signed on we share the, the feedback from the chats. 
And uh, the video for this session will be somewhere in Catalyst 230 portfolio where you can revisit it if you want to listen and watch. Thank you, Tambra. Thank you, Oni. Thank you, Mosun. Thank you, Dolapo. Thank you, Anna, for being with us. Uh, it's a pleasure. My name is Lucy Hopper, and this has been a very interesting session. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Bye. Bye.